Our next presentation will be by um, Elisa De Ranieri. Um, Elisa is Head of Editorial Process and Data Analytics for the Nature Journals. She will present her analysis of the uptake and outcome of an author-selected single-blind versus double-blind peer review um, at the Nature Journals. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Veronique. Uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. And just because we are disclosing conflict of interest, I would like to say that all authors uh, on this work are or have been employed by Springer Nature, who owns and publishes the Nature Journals. The, the aim of the study was to start investigating whether there is any implicit bias in peer review, uh, particularly at the Nature Titles. Uh, the Nature Titles introduced double-blind peer review as an optional uh, author service back in 2015 as a measure that might prevent uh, potential referee bias. So in this study, what we did was to compare single and double-blind uh, papers that were submitted to the Nature Titles to identify any potential uh, referee bias against characteristics of the authors such as the gender, the country or their institutional affiliation. The questions that we were trying to address were who are the authors that choose double blind in the first place and also whether there are any differences that we can observe between peer review outcomes of various review model and ultimately we want to answer the question is there any evidence for peer review bias. The data included uh, about 130,000 uh, submissions of primary research that were received at Nature, Nature Communications, and 23 of the Nature sister titles spanning all of the research disciplines. These papers were submitted over a two-year period between 2015 and 2017 and included both direct submissions and transfers between journals. Authors could choose at submission whether they were uh, opting in for double blind as an option or whether they would stick to single blind. Uh, and this was possible only for the direct submissions, not for the transfers where they couldn't modify their choice anymore. And editors were always aware of the characteristics uh, of the authors and also were aware of which choice of uh, review model they, they had made. In all of these studies that I'm going to present, we use the corresponding author as a proxy for authors. We analyzed several characteristics, starting with the gender. So we assigned female, male, or not assigned as a categories uh, for, you know, using the, the first name of the corresponding author and a third party service called Gender API. Um, in doing so, we discarded about 30,000 records because they came back with a confidence level that was not good enough. We then also uh, analyzed a measure of institutional prestige or institutional status, if you like, and we, we used, um, as a proxy, we've, we've used the, the 2016 Times Higher Education World University ranking for that. So what we did was to normalize the institution names using GREET and then group those institutions in status groups um, using the THE uh, ranking. So group one would be the group with the institutions with a higher status according to that ranking, where the ranking is between one and 10, group two is from 11 to 100, group three would be uh, ranks that is above 101. And at the same step of the analysis, we also normalize the country names. We then performed descriptive statistics for data exploration and used person key square and binomial tests for the analysis. So what we found is that 12% of our authors have chosen double-blind peer review. Uh, about 17% of authors are female, the rest are male, uh, excluding those that we can't determine the gender of. And we have found that there is no significant difference in the distribution of peer review model by gender. So both female and male uh, are more uh, as likely uh, to choose double-blind peer review as each other. We then uh, observed that there is a small but significant association between the journal tier and the review type. So here we analyzed uh, if there are any differences in, in the per percentage of double blind peer review papers if we look at different tiers of nature titles. So they will have a different perceived status and we see that Nature, for example, uh, which has the higher status, has a higher percentage of submissions that are received in the double blind option. It's in the darker color on this graph uh, compared to the sister journals and Nature Communications. 
We then also observed uh, that there is a correlation between the um, choice of peer review model and the perceived um, prestige or status of the institution as defined, as I was saying earlier, from this, the Times Higher Education World University ranking. So here in this graph, what we see is that institutions that are in the group with the higher status, group one, have a much smaller percentage of authors that choose double-blind peer review, about 4%, when we compare with group three, which is 13%. We've also studied uh, if there was any association between the country of, of the main affiliation of the corresponding author and the review type. What you see here are the uh, it's item, itemization of the 10 countries that are responsible for 80% of the submissions, uh, and we grouped every other country under other at the, uh, in the row at the bottom. So what you see here is that the United States and China, which are the topmost and second topmost submitters respectively, they have very different. Um, they have div very different take on on the double blind peer review uptake, as you can better see on on this graph, in which countries are listed in order of number of submissions. Uh, you can see the United States as a more as a prevalence of sing the single blind peer review uh, when we compare with China who has a higher take on double blind. At the bottom of the graph, you also see India, which has uh, an even higher percentage of papers that are submitted with double blind option, but we are talking here about, um, you know, of, of 200, 2,000 papers submitted from India as opposed to about 33,000 submitted from the US. Finally, we were also interested in understanding whether uh, there, is a, there is some correlation between the review model and the peer review outcome. And we've seen that both at the stage of the first editorial screening and later on when a decision is made post-review, whether, you know, whether the, the paper is finally accepted or rejected, there is quite um, a large correlation. Oh, sorry, I didn't do that. Uh, that there's quite um, a correlation between the success and the peer review model. Here you can see that both at the stage of sent to review, the first editorial screening, and the accepted after review, which is the final stage, um, double blind papers don't do as well as single blind uh, ones. And only about a third of double blind papers is sent to review compared to single blind, and only about half is then ultimately accepted as opposed to the single blind case. So finally, what we could address with this study is the question on who chooses the double blind option. And we have found that while there are no significant differences in the distribution by gender, there are quite significant ones in terms of the geographical origin of the authors, uh, and also in terms of the, the prestige, the perceived prestige of the journal the authors submit to and of the institutions that they come from. And this somehow uh, was expected. I'm a little bit surprised myself by the fact that we didn't observe a difference by gender, which I was expecting as the ones that we've seen in terms of country and, and institutions. Um, and then also we, we could uh, conclude that the double blind option is linked to less successful peer review uh, outcome. And this can be due to uh, the objective quality of the papers or could be due to uh, a bias that editors and peer reviewers might have on, with regard to the peer review model itself. So of all the questions that we were trying to address at the beginning, we've sort of addressed the first two, but the ones that we are really quite far away from addressing is whether there is any evidence for reviewer bias at our journals. Uh, because when we try to look at, uh, for example, the gender distribution of accepted papers, we can see that from the data that we have, that there is a higher percentage of papers that are accepted uh, under the double blind uh, review model that have female corresponding authors, then there is, sorry, I'm not doing this, I'm not sure why it keeps uh, flipping. Um, then, so the, effectively, female, female corresponding authors are accepted more frequently under double blind and single blind uh, model, but the, the opposite is true for, for single blind. So this would be a quite an interesting conclusion, unfortunately, because of the very small numbers of papers that we are talking about. These results are not uh, statistically significant, so in, we, we can't really conclude that this is a trend. 
Uh, and finally, a few uh, words on the limitations of this work. As I was saying, we didn't have enough data, <laughs> and this is the main problem. We've calculated that in order for us to uh, make uh, conclusions that are statistically significant, we would have to wait 100 years, which is not practical for most <laughs> purposes. Um, we didn't do any multivariate analysis or have any independent measure for manuscript quality. We didn't analyze the outcome post review by gender and country of referees or study the uptake by seniority of corresponding author or by research area. And not, neither will we ensure that referees were actually blinded to authorship, meaning we didn't check whether manuscripts were posted on preprint uh, servers. So ultimately, this analysis would have been much more meaningful if double blind peer review was mandated rather than optional. And sorry, and to conclude, <laughs> uh, yes, the, what we wanted to achieve here was to identify reviewer bias, and we still have work to do, as I was saying, in terms of studying the outcome by gender, country, institutions, and then we have to find a way of addressing it if we find it, and this making double blind preview compulsory would be one idea, or blinding editors could be another idea, and uh, you know, even running a, a bias awareness campaign, I think, would help. And with that, I would like to thank you your for your attention. Thank you, Elisa. Are there, are there any questions in the audience first? Um, I have a question with respect to your uh, failure to find what you expected to find with respect to gender influencing this decision. Do you have any reason to, um, do you have any insights into how frequently the person who was listed as the corresponding author was really making those decisions? Um, and did you look, um, for example, what percentage of corresponding authors were the senior authors on those papers? That's a very good question. As I was saying, we haven't analyzed seniority of the corresponding authors yet, but it's, it's, on, the, it's on the radar. And I do not have um, data to answer your first question on you know, what, how do we know that the corresponding authors that's listed on the manuscript tracking system was actually making the decision? Uh, I only have anecdotal evidence of that. So we, we, unfortunately, we don't have a way to, to track it for so many submissions. We have to go with what we have. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Daniel Oko from the American Fiscal Society. And we met before. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question that maybe you won't like which is, um, what are you doing to correct for possible bias by the editors? This is specifically relevant in questions like whether to send a manuscript out for review or not, which is done in the absence of any referee feedback. So isn't it possible that editors could be biased not only towards institutions, authors, but also whether or not those authors choose double-blind review in the first place? Yeah, that's a very good point. So as I was saying, this, the point of this study was mostly to analyze bias that peer reviewers have because that's what double blind peer review can, can address, right? This will not address uh, any bias from the editors. So as I was saying, uh, one option could be to have a trial, and some of our journals are thinking about this, to have a trial where we go triple blind so the editors are, bl are blinded too. This is something that we are considering seriously, and I think a couple of journals will start implementing this trial in the next 12 months, if, if everything goes as, as planned. Um, yeah, so that, that's one thing that we can do. And obviously, I mean, we have to trust our editors who are professional, you know, they're professional staff. They, they know what's at stake there, and they, are, they act responsibly. Obviously, everybody has unconscious bias. We are all human, and they, they are trained to ensure that any bias that they have doesn't affect the result. But I think going tri triple blind is possibly the way to go. We're going to go on the other side yeah. of the room, Valda. Hi, this is Valda Vinson from Science. And so, um, you know, I'm really behind professional editors. Um, but I, I was just battling to understand the slide that showed, I think you said 30% um, were going out, were being selected for review, but then they were being taken at 50% after review. And yeah. unless I misunderstood, does that mean that the single blind are actually performing better at review? The single blind perform better at both stages of review. So no, no, no. So the double blind, though. The yeah, there is a fa so the factor of a third become a factor of a half. So you're right in saying that it looks like the screening that editors do is harsher than the screening that the peer reviewers, reviewers do. do. This this seems the case from okay. the data. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I was surprised. Yeah. Another question. Bertis Alvin from the Finnish Medical Journal. We have just uh, transferred from single blind peer review to double blind. And uh, you could 
conclude that it's not very fair to give authors this option because when they think that, that revealing their names it has a positive effect, they can do that. And if they think that would have a negative effect, they hide it and they, their reviewers know all this. So it um, doesn't seem very fair. Uh, yeah, it, you can look at it both ways because I was quite baffled by this result actually, well not baffled but it surprised me that the, the fact that when people submit to Nature for example they go double blind more often than when they submit to Nature Communications which is sort of the counter argument to what, to, towards what you were just saying because it looks like when, you know, if you submit to uh, an, a journal with a higher status, you might want to make your name way in if you are, you know, a very well recognized PI for example, then this doesn't seem to be the case. Obviously, this is very preliminary data and we haven't analyzed for seniority of the corresponding authors or by research area, so it, it's, I don't have evidence to back what I'm saying yet, but I think that there are arguments in both ways. It's my short answer. Theo, we have an online question. No, this is oh. a question from me, I'm afraid, Verony. Uh, <laughs> Theo, Theo Bloom, BMJ, and I may be showing my statistical ignorance here, but I think you showed us that a lot more authors from China and India choose double-blind peer review, and a lot more of them are rejected. And I think we know that um, from other studies, from PLOS and so on, that authors from China and India are more likely to be rejected. So how have you controlled for... So in a way, I'd be more interested in those within the US who choose double-blind versus single-blind, or within a country, rather than taking the countries that have high choice of double-blind and saying more of them are rejected. Uh, if I understand correct, so we, here we haven't studied the rejection rate by country, so this is just based on the submissions. We, don't, we haven't studied, we haven't correlated the outcome with the country with the review model, so this is something that it's, we have to do still. Um, so here what we have done, we've simply said all the submissions that come from country A, this is the breakdown of double blind and single blind, this is all we have done at this stage. But because we know that the rejection rate is different for those countries, in a way, ah, I'm, reassured, I'm reassured by your result because it says to me that even when you're blind to which country people come from, the rejection rate is the same. That's yeah, as I said, I can't really judge on whether the rejection rate is the same from this data because I don't have to break down by country, but I see what you're saying in yeah. terms of countries that I think they are discriminated against, they tend to choose double blind more and this is something that was expected, yes. Thank you. I'm going to um, interject with a question that we've uh, received from Facebook, um, which is basically what, based on the um, uh, analysis you've done, do you recommend single blind, double blind or triple blind review? Well, if, if we could mandate double blind, I think that would be uh, the mm -hmm. way to go. And the next stage to that is triple blind. I think that the fact that it's not mandated can sort of muddle the waters a bit. So double blind, I think, could be the standard. My, this is my personal opinion, mm -hmm. by the way. It's not the company opinion. But yeah, I think that double blind should be mandated for all journals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Derringer. Uh, I'm relatively new to this business, so my question may be a little naive, but it seems to me that there's a major confounding factor here, that being the quality of the work. And I, I, I don't know how you separate that, but for instance, one might assume that poor quality work might request double blinding. Um, so have you had any comments or observations in that regard? That's, that's a very good question. As I was saying at the end, we haven't controlled for quality separately, which is one of, it's, it's a flaw of this study, if you like, but anecdotally, because I've been an editor for, for several years for our titles, and anecdotally, I, my experience was that the quality of what's submitted double blind, it is inferior, and it's sort to what's submitted single blind, and it might, there might be several reasons for this, but I do not have data yet to back what I'm saying up. This is just anecdotal uh, evidence. Thank you, Fiona Godley from the BMJ. And just to say how great it is to have biomedical journals um, represented at the Peer Review Congress so, so prominently. So thank you for being here and to science and others of you who have joined the, joined the community. I just wanted to ask whether you had thought about open peer review as um, an option. You talked about triple blind as your preference. I just wanted to encourage Nature and other biomedical science journals to consider open peer review as an option and also to take an evidence-based approach to evaluating that because 
uh, rather than jumping to one conclusion. Uh, certainly at the BMJ we have open peer review and pre-publication histories published and we're doing the same with BMJ Open um, and also we're about to launch BMJ Open Science. So we've got quite a big um, tradition of open peer review and we think it works well, we think it's the way to go. Uh, we think it's great for credit as well as accountability for the peer reviews, and we've done randomised trials of it. So I just would encourage you to include that as one of your options. Yeah, we, we, have, we are making progress on that sense in that nature now as a trial for referee accreditation where uh, the names of the referees get published, while Nature Communications as another trial where they actually publish the reports. So we are making progress. Is that it's, you know, it's, a, it's difficult to, to move in that direction, but we are making little progresses. <laughs> uh, good morning, I'm Sharon Quimby um, with uh, American Academy of Neurology. Um, and I was just thinking that in a, in a mandated um, double-blind scenario, there's still gonna be little breadcrumbs when you're looking at the study funding, the conflicts of interest, and the disclosure statements. Um, and I just feel like um, that's also gonna give peer reviewers and editors a clue as to who the authors are, who the uh, you know who the uh, you know the affiliated universities are. So I still think maybe there's a little balance of power uh, issue there. That's a very good point. And also, some communities, such as the communities in the physical sciences, have a, a lot of you know people post on preprints a lot, and that obviously goes against double blind because referees can just Google up the t the title and they see the author. So yeah, the, the, there are all sorts of things to consider. This is a very good point. Thank you. And, and folks uh, often reference their own work, so you know you just have yeah. to look at the reference list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. I think we might have another question in, sure. in the interim. Um, do you have any sense, Elisa? Did you do any um, qualitative uh, uh, surveys, or, or what are the motivations of people? I mean, you've, you've showed us the data about the gender and the and the affiliations, for example. But do you have a sense of the motivation of people who choose um, double blind? Again, this is anecdotal from my own experience as an editor, and I think uh, authors that come from certain countries or from institutions that are not well recognized for academic excellence, they feel that they have, are being discriminated against, and this is a tool they have to you know, try to prevent referee bias, so I think that's why they choose it, and that, as I was saying, I was a little bit surprised that the, there wasn't any gender uh, mm -hmm. difference in the gender distribution for that, because normally I thought female authors tend to feel discriminated against. Mm -hmm. um, is there time for another question? Yes, there is time for another question. Uh, so uh, my name is Constance Zhu. I'm a medical student from Yale. Uh, so my question is, uh, you showed that you excluded um, the, the papers where if you run the gender API and the confidence is less than 80%. Yeah. Um, not to add, I think there are a, another layer of, uh, of complication here is that, uh, for example, I run my, my original Chinese name and it was showed that I was male. And so, um, so if you run that and if you set it as 80%, uh, my paper would have been excluded. So this is just another layer that might impact how people um, with foreign first names to be uh, considered, what do you think? Now that, that's a very fair point that normally for Asian names it's, it's where the difficulty lies in, in finding out the gender and we can't do this manually for thousands of records. So that's, I take the point that there's this, um, the fact that we've discarded some of the results might affect certain um, ethnicities more than others. We have time for one short question. Sure, uh, Kristen Mueller, Melanoma Research Alliance. Um, just a question if you got feedback from reviewers at all. Was it easier or harder to find reviewers for the double blind or any assessment that way? Again, anecdotally and from surveys that we run, people are not put off by double blind. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa.